Hey guys, this is the third Dharma Talk in the Dharma Talk series from 2011. Check down below in the controls, you should see full English subtitles are available and maybe some other languages too. Just for the sake of the video here, this is 2011, uh, August, and every year I do a series of Dhamma talks, uh, this time of the year, because monks and nuns are not supposed to be traveling. Uh, they'll stay in the temples and they have an intensive period of study over this three months. Uh, this year, then, the, top, the theme of the talks is emptiness, and I'm looking at the, uh, the nature of uh, and this teaching about emptiness. We're actually comparing whether certain kinds of sports or performing arts or martial arts and these kind of things, where somebody gets completely into the zone of what they're doing, the conscious mind, the meditation or the thinking tends to stop and you get completely absorbed or you have an experience of oneness with the action that you're undertaking. There's some question of whether this is meditation or it's not meditation. I would actually argue that in these kind of things you're actually absorbed totally in what you're doing. So it's not really meditation. Meditation is you're supposed to be self-aware. Uh, I've had something like this. I wasn't a sportsman, as you probably know if you were here last week. I didn't like sports or anything that I had to do outside. Uh, this is why the British are very good at sports that you do in pubs. You know, we're the best dance players, snooker players. The only time I experienced this zone, if, it's, if it is that thing, is when I was working as a welder. And we, one time I had a big set of frames that I had to weld up. And it, actually a team of us were welding up. I think it took six days. And you just get lost in your activity. You've got this uh, black visor on, so you can't see anything except the very bright spot that you're welding. And I got totally absorbed, but even when it came to lunchtime, I'm like, no, no, I want to get back. I want to get back into that slot. At the time, I couldn't figure out why I would enjoy that. But I loved it. I loved being in the zone. I loved just being, just being completely absorbed in what I was doing. It felt very nice. And so what is this uh, emptiness? In meditation, we're doing something similar. We're emptying out. And we have a teaching in Buddhism about emptiness. And the Usually we find this teaching in Mahayana Buddhism and they have a lot of teachings about, and a lot of books about emptiness. It sounds a little ironic, right? Uh, that you can write so much about nothing at all. But in the Theravada, which is the original form of Buddhism, uh, what I'm proposing is all the teachings are there it's designed to help you empty out. They're not designed to talk about emptiness. So we're not talking about emptiness like in Mahayana, there are very in-depth teachings about it by a chap called Nagarjuna. Uh, in the Theravada Buddhism, then, the teachings are designed to help you empty out rather than talking about emptiness itself. The first thing that we empty out are the thoughts and concepts, the enlightenment, the thing that yogis and mystics and sages and hermits uh, disappear off to caves and forests and jungles and go and sit year after year in meditation. In all traditions, not just in Buddhism, this is a, a calling of humanity. Certain people, certain human beings want to do this. Uh, the Desert Fathers of Christianity went out to the caves. So this, uh, this particular uh, calling then, what we're doing is we're emptying out. The first thing that we're emptying out is all the thoughts and concepts. What it is that you're looking for, or what it is that you're trying to attain to, is not something that you're going to figure out. Figuring stuff out is another layer of concepts. And there is no end to that. There is no end to how much stuff you can figure out. And it's good, it's good fun. I mean, I like it too. I like psychology, I like history. Uh, I'm reading about genealogy at the moment is quite interesting. Uh, layers and layers of concepts. But whatever it is that yogis are looking for is not a concept. It's not another thing that you're going to be able to figure out. If it was, you could just do it from a book. You know, you could just come and read the book, and then you get it. You get the concept, and you're done. 
Unfortunately, it takes a lot longer than that. It takes like, a sign of practice, because you have to be able to empty out all of your concepts and go back to what we call yatha bhutan, or seeing things as they really are, rather than how you think they are. Now, concepts are very important. The, uh, our whole world depends upon concepts. Uh, the world that we live in, our friends, our family, our work, everything, all of these things uh, are concepts. And they're, they're incredibly important to human beings. Uh, one that I was reading about yesterday, really quite, in my mind, horrific, but there was a, a woman who was trying to break the world record for being the heaviest woman in the world. And she needs to pack on an extra 50 kilograms to do it. And this, to me, is, is, is chasing after some kind of concept, like, okay, I've beaten a world record. And what do you do with that world record? What do you do with that concept? You, you need a trophy, and then you need to polish your trophy and look at your trophy every so often to remind yourself, yeah, I was the best, the fastest, the biggest, um, in her case, the heaviest. Concepts are incredibly important, and we go a long way uh, to chasing after them. But with the meditation, we're going in the opposite direction. We're trying to empty out all of these concepts to find a totally different way of seeing a totally different way of being. So the analogy is, if you have a cup of tea and you want coffee, you don't pour coffee into your teacup. What you have to do is you have to empty the tea out first and then you can have a cup of coffee. So we're trying to empty out all of these concepts. It doesn't mean that you enter into blind faith or that you believe people or anything. It means that you have to directly experience for yourself. Specifically not trusting or not believing anybody else. Is specifically looking for and trying to find that experience for yourself. What happens when you empty out all of the concepts? What happens when you turn the direction of the mind back in upon itself? What you have is very often described as mind knowing mind. Normally the mind knows stuff. Normally the mind knows concepts. And we're going to, tonight we're going to look at and analyze what is the stuff that the mind knows. Uh, normally the mind knows stuff, but the mind never actually knows itself. It is not reflective. Uh, it's a little bit, bit like the eye can only see forms, the eye can never see itself. Even if you look in a mirror, you're still not seeing the eye, you're seeing a reflection of the eye, you're seeing an image of the eye, the eye can never see itself. So the same trick with the mind, the mind only ever knows stuff. And yet, the mind itself is the source, the primordial nature, it's the Buddha nature. If you empty everything out first, what's left, the mind starts to become aware of itself. Now, this is a long path and it goes very deep, but um, actually anybody can start to get a taste of it. Even just when you start to meditate, uh, you say to yourself, be aware. You start to see, okay, the mind, uh, the thoughts, and ideas and the concepts are all moving through the mind and you start to see them as a distraction. What are all the thoughts and ideas moving through? You start to get this feeling that there's a base somewhere there that is lying deeper than the level of thoughts and concepts. And so here's one description. The true Dharma is the mind. The mind of each and every one of us is the highest Dharma. And it's already right there in our heart. Apart from this, there is no other Dharma principle. Abandon your thoughts and explanations altogether. Then the mind in the mind will be pure. This is the primordial nature that is already there in all of us. This is by Lumpur Dun. So, it sounds very Mahayana, it sounds very kind of Indian, but this is the time Master who was talking about this. So the more you empty out these thoughts and concepts, the more you can get back to mind knowing mind, or being aware of awareness, it's often called. So, I want to make um, a little story, tell you a little story. And this is a story of a uh, monk called Matsu, and he uh, was a very keen meditator, and he was doing his meditation ardently every day. And then one day, uh, his teach a teacher comes along, a great master, um, and the great master was called uh, Hui Jiang. But if you're Thai, you know, I like to call him Hu Jiang. And uh, 
which is a little in joke for time seekers. Um, so Yu Jiang um, comes along and he sees he sees Matsu meditating and he says, "What are you doing?" And Matsu says, "I am meditating." And Yu Jiang says, "Why are you meditating?" And Matsu says, "I am meditating to attain to Buddhahood, to enlightenment." And then Xu Zhang, he goes off and he comes back with a brick and a piece of cloth and he starts rubbing the brick. And uh, Matsu says, Master, what are you doing? And the Master says, Xu Zhang says, I want to make a mirror, so I'm going to polish the brick until I get the mirror. Matsu says, Master, however long you polish that brick, you are never going to make a mirror. And Hu Jiang says, exactly. It's not many knobs of knowing and understanding going on. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to leave that story with you. Don't let me forget, but at the end, um, we'll come back to this story and then hopefully you should see a little closer the meaning of it. Now I want to jump to uh, theoretical models. And this will all tie in together uh, as we go through the evening. A theoretical model um, is um, something that is designed to explain and predict something. A theoretical model is not truth or reality in itself, it is just there to, be, to explain and predict. Uh, I can give you an example of a model that uh, predicts but doesn't explain. If you were to sit on a desert island with, uh, with a notebook, the diary, and you were to know when the tides come up and when the tides go down. After a period of time, if you keep careful notes, you would figure out there is a pattern to the tides coming up and down. You may even notice that there's a relationship in this pattern to the moon. After a while, you can make up a theoretical model that will predict how the tides are going to be. Now at this point, you can only predict, but you haven't explained, because you haven't explained why the tide goes up and down. To do that, you have to know about gravity, and the tides actually move because of the gravitational pull of the moon as, as it circles the Earth. This is what creates the tides. Once you have that in place, and you know about gravity, you have a complete model. This is a theoretical model that explains and predicts something that you can see. But a theoretical model itself is not reality, it is just a tool that you're using for a particular purpose. Okay. So I can give you another example, say the population of Thailand, 55% uh, female, 45% male. I don't know if that's accurate, I think it's slightly more female than male. Well if you're building a big shopping mall, or something like that, or a big stadium, uh, you want to know how many male toilets to build and female toilets to build. So this bit of information, this model of the population of Thailand is quite useful. You may also split the population of Thailand into uh, school, uh, working population and retire. And the balance between these three is very important to economists and to government. In the West, the population is aging. So in 20 years time, there's going to be a lot more people who are retired and a lot fewer people who are working. So that affects tax, tax laws. Um, if you are in the hospital trade, you will have to provide different kinds of care for an older population and a younger population. So you can see that particular model of the population time and how use. You may model it differently. You may say there are 60% Thais, 30% ethnic Chinese, 2% um, Indian maybe, 2% Farak, Westerner, and 1% British Lager Lounge here on tourism. This would be of interest to say somebody, a geneticist who is working on medicine, and certain kind of medicines work with certain kind of um, genes, which is something that I've just been reading about. So these are different ways to model the population of Thailand. It's not that one model is correct and the other models are wrong. It's just that the use of the models is slightly different. You're using them for a different purpose. Um, Freud had models. He modeled what it is to be a human being. He said you have a conscience, a self you're aware of, 
the preconscious and subconscious, which is stuff you can remember if you want to, and the unconscious, which is stuff that you've forgotten. And this summarizes you. It's not that there are three physical consciousnesses. It's just a convenient way to explain this. It's a convenient way to explain being a human being, right? No, Chomsky had one. He, he said that human beings have an innate predisposition predisposition to fluffing words and to learning language and he called this the language acquisition device and the language acquisition device works while you're younger and you're learning and you need to learn languages but by the time you're about 14 or 15 the brain needs all its resources to do other stuff passing down the word friends and all the other stuff that teenagers get into so it diverts resources and it closes down this language acquisition device and diverse resources to other things. There isn't an actual device, it's not an actual little ticking thing, you know, in one part of the brain. Uh, it's a theoretical model to explain something and predict something. All of the teachings in Buddhism are theoretical models. They're not designed that you have to learn every model, and, because there's a lot of teachings in Buddhism, there's a lot of stuff. But the point is, you don't need to learn all of it. Each of the particular teachings is there uh, to make a particular prediction and a particular explanation. In nearly all cases, these models are there to help you empty out. And there are different, different ways, different models to help you empty out. When we look at it in this sense, then the whole idea of teachings becomes a little bit more sensible. They're simply tools that we're using, they're not absolute truths. Even the Four Noble Truths in Buddhism, which is supposed to be the highest truth in Buddhism, Four Noble Truths, suffering, the cause of suffering, cessation of suffering in the path. Even these were called Arya Satcha, the Noble Truths. They weren't called Paramatha Satcha, which means ultimate truths. They're noble in the sense that you can use them for a good purpose, but they're not actually true in and of themselves. They're not actually real in and of themselves. We may summarize the Four Noble Truths as Two Noble Truths. We may be able to expand it into Five Noble Truths. It doesn't really matter. The point is that we're using it in the right way. So two weeks ago I was talking about free hatred and delusion. This is the desire of human beings to be stimulated. And we stimulate ourselves or we entertain ourselves by putting the mind either on stuff that we like, we dislike, or we feel neutral about. This covers everything. Is there any other activity that you can do that you can engage in that isn't based upon liking it, disliking it, or neutral? Remember, all of these activities you actually enjoy. So, like watching TV is neutral or inane uh, in the sense that it has no particular purpose. Um, but we do enjoy all of these. Even hating we also enjoy. Disliking we also enjoy. You, when you get angry, you really want to be angry. When you're solving problems, you really want to solve problems. We have a whole industry devoted to this, it's called Hollywood. And um, simulation based upon liking, we have romantic comedies. Simulation based upon disliking, we have horror movies. And simulation based upon the name, we have anything with Mel Gibson in it. The following week was talking about, uh, or last week was talking about the three kinds of suffering. And again, this is another teaching, but there's nowhere to go after this. There's the suffering of the body and the mind. It's interesting. Lots of interesting things we can say about that. Then there's so the suffering of change. First of all, everything changes. You can never actually rest. You're always going to have to work. You're always going to have to be looking after yourselves and people. And you can never actually stop still for very long. But more than that, when you see it in the mind, when you see the mind just doesn't stop changing, this really starts to shake you. You really start to um, feel like doing the meditation because you can see just how crazy your own mind is. Then we have the deepest level, the Sankara Dukkata, which means just having a mind state is a form of discomfort, it's a form of constraint. What if you could give up all mind states altogether? This is what the Buddha called enlightenment or Jado Vimuti actually the liberation of the heart when you can when you can find the stilling of all mind states. Remember you're still awake and you're still aware at this point. 
So that's another model. And again, this model of the dukkha or suffering is there. It covers everything. That's every possible layer of the mind that you can go through, uh, going into it deeper and deeper and quieter and quieter. And you find there's still a motivation there to soft still, to seek enlightenment. So these are some of the um, models. All the models of Buddhism explain this, what it is to be a human being immediately, rather than your concepts. Now I want to do a little bit of um, exercise, interactive exercise. Suppose there is something, uh, some moments of being awake or aware. So I'm going to say the camera here, if you can see the camera. Okay. In a moment of seeing that camera, just do it for a moment, put your mind on the camera, see it and know it. See if you can keep it in your mind. What happens? Okay, so in that moment, camera in this moment, what is present? What is your experience as a human being? Anybody? Words. What words? Shining. So you're starting to describe the camera. So you're not looking at the camera, you're looking at shininess. Right? Okay. And when shininess is there, what else is there? Is there anything else there in your experience? Definition or a concept, subtle that's there. Okay. Mental. Okay. Mental. Okay, so you're looking at what the camera's made of. Is when you're identifying metal, are you still identifying camera or have you changed the object that you're looking at? You get the point. You're either looking at camera or you're looking at metal or you're looking at shining. Anybody else? What do you experience when we say look at the camera? Vicky? Splash of photos, and you've taken photos just before this, so my mind's <laughs> really, it's not even the object, and it's going, okay. it's going fast. Okay, so these are perceptions based around the camera. Okay, that's good. Anything else? Yeah. Well, I, I just have an image. Okay. It's like a fuzzy image. Slightly. Like Okay. Right, because you're getting older and your eyes aren't so good. <laughs> That's a hint to lower the belt. <laughs> this is subtle form of dukkha, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, no, that's all. Okay, so a slightly fuzzy image. So this is good. We've got an image. We've got uh, perceptions based around the image. We've also noticed that we're changing the object from the camera onto other objects, like shininess or metal, or uh, memories of what I did with the camera earlier. Anything else there? Okay, a concept of a machine. Okay, I like that. And so we have a concept of it. We have a physical form of it. We have the color, the shininess, we have the use of it. Anything else? When you look, I find that when I look at any object or there's so much movement the when you stop to see because the mind is moving. Yeah. Right. And, but what's interesting is that there is some kind of reference that that you grab onto that takes you back to it. So the instruction was look at the camera. Okay. So he so said there's a kind of reference that you latch onto that takes you back to it. So without, um, I mean, it, camera okay. of many things. So you're always going, but what? So can it, I just repeat what that? Is it that brings back okay. that other idea? So it's saying that you get you get lost because you start to describe the elements of the camera, um, but then you realise that you've lost the object of cameraness, the the concept, and you keep getting drawn back to the concept of the camera. Um, so what you're really saying as the observing is you can't hold anything in the mind for very long. If you try and hold it in the mind for very long, the mind will naturally start to wander away and start to analyse and look at the qualities of it. And then you have to keep reminding no camera, and no, 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 the camera. Uh, to get back to that cameraness, usually you have to do one of two things. Either you have to say the word camera gently to yourself, 
or you have to look at it visually. Uh, that way you can relaunch camera in your mind, but it's not going to stay there for very long. Okay. So good, we actually got most of the way there. This is looking at how the mind really is. We're trying to look at what is there in any one moment of experience. And the particular teaching in Buddhism uh, that deals with this is called the five khandhas. Khandhas means aggregates. And um, these five aggregates, they're usually talked about, and, and Buddhist scholars, they love to write long lists of things. And they write this aggregate and they fill it up with lists and lists of stuff. But remember, Buddhism is supposed to be taking you to something simpler, easier, to letting go, to emptying out. Now I'm going to go through what these five are, then we're going to put them together and see how they work together. First of these five is Rupa, or form. And form is, I think the word form actually meant colour originally, but form means the form that something takes. So, uh, in this case, a visual form. You know, there's a certain size to it, there are certain colours to it, and there's a certain shape to it. Um, with sounds, there's a certain loudness, there's a certain uh, volume, there's a certain direction uh, to sounds. Um, things that you can taste, there's sweet, there's sour, there's um, salty to the body, there's hot, there's cold, and there's pressure. I don't think the body feels anything else. I think it's just those three. Somebody may be able to correct me on that. But three things that the body can feel. Um, so these are the, this is the form, this is the physical attribute that something will take. Now this form uh, may be mentated or it may be external. So, for example, uh, a camera and the thought of a camera. Now the one thing that people missed out when I was talking about the camera, nobody said whether you wanted the camera or not. Whatever the form is, the shape, the colour, the noise, the sound, the heat, the cold, the pressure, that's the form of the object. Okay. Now you can um, see something also in the mind, just as you can see it in the, in the real life. So you can close your eyes and you can see the camera again in your mind. Uh, if you do neurology, you'll know that this is seeing goes into your occipital, occipital lobe at the back of the head here. And the curious thing is that if you were to look at the camera, you get a certain light pattern will arise in the back of your head. But if you imagine the camera, you get the exact same formation uh, in the same place. So that's physical form. Um, the sky is blue. That's the physical nature of the sky. Um, but there is no east or west. So the Buddha actually taught this. He said, um, the sky knows no east or west. That is, the sky is just that form. It's blue, that's what you can see. One thing is the form. Second thing is the perceptions. You know what a camera is used for. You know how you've used the camera in the past. These are your perceptions, or the best word, because um, it confuses people, is historicity. And if you can sneak that one into a sentence, next time you're having a cappuccino, you'll be very proud of you. The historicity of an object, you know what it is and what it's used for. So I know Arthur here, I know who he is, and I know he's a friend of mine, and that's a whole base of, based on the history that Arthur and I have together. Um, just about anything that you can get, anything that you can look at, you have some kind of um, perception about what it is. Okay. Often the perceptions change, like poor old planet Pluto, who got demoted. They argued for a long time, a couple of years back, on whether Pluto is a planet or not. And um, there's actually campaigns and people with billboards say Pluto. Um, and they were going to ban it, they were going to say it's a, it's a body, it's not a planet, because it has their old orbit. And then they realized that nobody actually knows what a planet is. You know, we live on one, we're stuck to one, but we don't actually know what a planet is. So there's all these definitions go around, and eventually they redesignated it um, as a dwarf planet. So it's not a planet, it's not another planet. Um, the best example is Pavlov's dogs. 
he noticed that when he would ring a bell just before he would feed the dogs, and he was actually a biologist, he was studying the physical nature of the body and the saliva glands. Uh, he wasn't a psychologist. But he noticed then, if he rang a bell before he gives the dog the food, after a short while the dog is trained, and if you just ring the bell, it'll start to dribble. A little bit like monks at 11 o'clock, which is our feeding time. We kind of know that some alarm bell goes inside us. This is perception. The dog is learning a perception to put on the bell. Okay. So the Buddha said, perceptions uh, are the results of our habits. Okay. So, um, we have the perception. The third one of the five is Vedana, uh, or feeling. And this is liking or disliking or neutral. So if you like my camera and you wanted it, that's liking. If you thought it looks a bit rubbish and cheap, it's a bit disliking. Or if you don't like me taking photos of you, you have a disliking. Um, or most probably you just had a neutral feeling because you didn't care one way or the other. The liking and the disliking uh, arises with practically any object that you can put your mind onto. There's always some kind of attraction or repulsion. Now it doesn't always depend upon the object. All of these five, and we're on the third of the five, all of these five work together like a song, like a band, like a piece of music. So sometimes liking or disliking can change depending upon your perception. If you change your perception of somebody or something, then um, you change whether you like the, that thing or you dislike them. So if you like a person, and they do something a little bit stupid, well, you still like them, because you have a history of it. Only if they keep doing stupid things, you start to change your view. Um, liking and disliking is a shortcut. Do you like the noise? <laughs> um, is a shortcut to making decisions. Because the world is too complicated for us to like think about things every time. Evolution gave us this shortcut whereby we can uh, make decisions. So I know Arthur, I like Arthur, and that's the shortcut. So if I see him, I don't think do I want to speak to him, or don't I want to speak to him. Uh, I have a shortcut, like, oh, I like, I have a liking there. Um, so evolutionary psychologists say this is a, this gives us an evolutionary advantage and makes us fitter for survival. Personally, I think they take it a little bit too far. Uh, so that's Vedana. Um, three kinds, liking, disliking, and neutral, but sometimes the Buddha said there was five kinds. Liking of the body, pleasant of the body, unpleasant of the body, neutral of the body, pleasant of the mind, and unpleasant of the mind. He said you can't have neutral of the mind, which I think is a debatable point. I think it's interesting. So here we have five kinds of liking and disliking. And there was one time the Buddha's disciples started to argue about this. And some of them said there are three kinds of liking, and some of them said, no, there's five kinds of liking, and they started to beat each other up. And then they went back to the Buddha and said, right, which one of us is right? And the Buddha said, sometimes I say there's three, sometimes I say there's five. You know? An example of, they're just a different model. When he uses five, it's just a different model that he's using. We don't get attached to whether there's three or there's five. These teachings are tools, are sticks that we're supposed to beat, beat each other about, or argue about. They're just to be used. Other times there were six kinds of liking and eighteen kinds of liking. Six kinds of being liking of the eye, the ear, the taste, the body, and the mind, etc. Moving on swiftly, the fourth of the group is called Sankara. And Sankara are mind states. When you looked at this camera, you have awake, wakefulness, or tiredness, or interest, or disinterest, or elasticity of mind, or brightness of mind, or dullness of mind, or concentration, uh, or focus, or non-focus. Your mental makeup has a certain kind of form to it. Okay. So if I come and um, wake you up at six o'clock in the morning, and I shake you, and I wake you up, and I start telling you about this really good book that I'm reading called Before the Dawn, about human genetics. You're probably going to give me a kick, right? 
But if I come to you at six o'clock in the evening and we're having a cappuccino and I tell you about this book that I'm reading, you're like, oh, that's interesting. So what's different? The same object, the same rupa, the same form, in this case the form is the words that I'm telling you. The same sanya, like perception of the book. Uh, feeling has changed. But what is really different is the mindset. When you're tired, you're not interested. When you're, when you're awake, you're more interested. And we carry mind states around with us, independent of the thing that we're looking at. So one time I went to see my friend, and actually I went to see my friend's father for a game of chess. And I knocked on the door and his, his mother answered. And he said, oh hello Panda, uh, your friend isn't here today. And he said, oh, actually I'm not here for my friend, I want to see his father. And his mother went like this. <laughs> And she spun around, she stomped off into the house. And so I, little trepidatious is that the word, I go into the house and then I find his father. And it turns out she's in a bad mood with her husband, you see. Um, so even when she's talking to me, I haven't done anything wrong, right? But she still had this reaction coming from the bad mood. This is carrying a mood around with you, or carrying mind states around with you, that then colour your interactions with other people. If you win the lottery and someone calls you an idiot, you're like, I'm a rich idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you don't care. If you're having a bad day and someone calls you an idiot, you're like, you know, you're more likely to, to give them a thumb than, than normal. So these are mind states that you carry around with you. Uh, they were also called vol volitional impulses. They were called, confusingly, formations. Um, they were called conditionings or conditioned things, conditioned states, something like that. Enlightenment, by the way, is not having any of these conditions of mind. So very often the Buddha described enlightenment as, uh, like the night, the day when he became enlightened, he said, how is it for people to see? This enlightenment, namely the stilling of all mind states. Mind states has the connotation of something that's put together or made up in time, bungdeng, something that's been literally cooked up by ingredients. The unconditioned, this means conditioned, the unconditioned is the opposite, something that isn't cooked up, isn't born, doesn't die, is immutable. And this is what's, what is mind seen mind or or the jitta. Um, those of you who are solidly may know that this has a very direct parallel with Christianity where you have the creator and the created. All created things are in sin, only the creator or, or the uncreated is not in sin. Buddhism is the exact same teaching. All things that are conditioned are suffering by nature. But that means that thing which is unconditioned is not suffering by nature. Um, so that is the uh, mind states. The last one, vinyana or consciousness. Consciousness is the wrong translation. It should be cognizing. When something arises, when you put your mind onto something, you have consciousness of that object. When you no longer see that object, the consciousness ceases. So in Buddhism, consciousness isn't something that is continually there that things pass in and out of. That may be a good model for consciousness, and in psychology that's how we study it. We're not saying that that isn't correct, but we're saying in Buddhism the model that we use is consciousness arises with the object and it ceases with the object. This is why I think <coughs> it should really be cognizing or co cognating, I think is the word. Um, so when you put your mind on the camera, Con camera consciousness arose. Can you just have consciousness without an object? Even in psychology you can't. William James, uh, one of the fathers of psychology, he said this too. He said you will never have consciousness without being conscious of something. One might argue that in Buddhism if you get to pure consciousness, independent of objects, that is mind-knowing mind or that is enlightenment. That's open for argument. I'd be open to that line of thought. But I'm not going to propose it and try and defend it, because I know what Buddhists are like. Um, I know what Buddhist scholars are like. I get beaten for it. Um, 
So the consciousness arises with the object and it ceases with the object. So you had camera consciousness, but for the last two minutes, that had gone completely from your mind, right? You had handed consciousness. The noise distracts you upstairs, you have hearing consciousness. Okay, quick exercise. Right now, can you hear the sounds from upstairs? Okay, put your attention onto your feeling of the toes in your right foot. Can you feel them? Do you have a taste in your mouth right now? Is it salty? Is it sweet? Is it neutral? Okay, now while you're tasting this taste, are you hearing the noises from upstairs? Right. The noises are there. You might argue that you're hearing them, but you're not listening to them. That means you're not putting your attention onto those noises. Consciousness that arises only when you put your attention onto something, and you only are attentive to one thing at a time. If you're feeling the feelings in your toes of your right foot, you're not feeling the feeling of the toes in your left foot. If you create an object, all my toes, you can feel all your toes, but if you try and hold it in your mind, you're going to, just like the camera, you're going to start picking down onto one particular toe and moving your awareness around. While you're doing that, you're not tasting the taste in your mouth. Put the mind on the taste in your mouth, you're not paying attention to what you can see. Now while you're driving a car, most of your attention is usually on what you can think. Now fortunately, you don't crash the car. So one might argue that subconsciously you're still seeing and moving and reacting. That's okay. What we're interested in is the conscious. What are you doing consciously? Many movements you do subconsciously. If you go to the bathroom here, you tell yourself, go to the bathroom, but your legs move unconsciously until you get a lot older. And actually, um, studies on older people find that they will do things far more consciously than younger people, which is interesting. And they did this by putting objects, they would tell people to walk along the path, and young and old people, and you'd have to maneuver your way around these objects on the path to get to the other end of the path. At the end of the path, they asked the young people what were the objects that you had to move around, and most of them didn't know. But when they asked the old people, the old people tended to know. Old people tend to do more things more consciously than young people. I wish I found it uh, interesting. Um, one recent um, test, there's a square where people walk diagonally across this big square. And so what the experimenters wanted to do is find out whether people, how aware people were of their surroundings as they walk across the square, especially while they were talking on a mobile phone. <laughs> And so the object that they put to see if people would notice it was a clown riding on a unicycle. <laughs> now most of you think, I've noticed that. But the fact is that most people didn't notice the clown. If you were talking to another person, you had a slightly less chance of noticing it. But if you were talking on a mobile phone, you were down to like a 20% chance whether you even noticed a clown on a unicycle you know, just off the path. The fact is that we only put our attention onto one thing at a time. And we like to think that we can talk on our phone and still drive the car at the same time. But the point is that all this stuff, you're not even aware that you don't notice it. Those people weren't aware that they didn't see the clown on the unicycle. The mind goes onto one thing at a time, and it jumps from object to object to object. And whatever you put the mind onto, that object will start to dissipate. You can't keep cameraness in your mind for very long without starting to identify parts of the camera and then you've already got a different object. I can't keep Arthur in my mind, sorry to keep using you. I can't keep Arthur in my mind without saying the word Arthur or thinking about things that he does or things that he likes or things that we've done together in the past. You can't do it. So consciousness arises with the object that you're looking at. Okay, now we've done all five of these. The five are codependent. 
They do not arise independently. They rely upon each other. Form is very much based externally. Mind states are very much based internally. Perception and feeling are very much based upon the two. But the point is they play together like a band. Something like the Beatles. Think about the Beatles. Do you hear two uh, drums, um, what is it, drums, bass, and two big guitars? Or do you hear one song? There's only four Beatles, we want five. I was thinking the Spice Girls is five of them. <laughs> Until Jerry Halliwell left, Ginger Spice, and there was only four. And I'm suddenly a little embarrassed that I know that. Um, <laughs> Okay, let's take the Beatles, uh, but we'll, we'll say the, 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 um, the song, the lyrics, okay, the singing. So you have the four instruments, the drums, the bass, two lead guitars, and the singing. But what you hear is one thing, one song, right? So this is the song of experience. The song moves all the time. Just so these five pandas, these five groups, on any moment of perception, are moving the whole time. And the Buddha described it as like this, he said, it's like being in a fast-moving stream, grabbing at branches or grabbing at the banks uh, that you can't get hold of. You're continually being swept along by the stream. Um, interestingly, with music too, you can focus the mind onto the bass. The bass becomes the foreground of your attention. attention. The rest of the music becomes the background of your attention. And this is called Gestalt psychology, or Gestalt perception. Gestalt being the thing that you call into the foreground, everything else being in the background. And we can do this the same with our own experience. We can focus on the feelings of liking and disliking. We can focus on the fall, heat, cold, light, color, etc. We can focus on perception. Uh, we can focus on the feeling of consciousness. Okay? <clears throat> so, you can pick anything, any moment, anything that you can look at or think about. These five are there. This is what you're calling up into your mind. You think about a person, a son or a daughter. You think about a song, a chair, a microphone, a speaker, a noise. What you're doing is you're calling it up into the mind with some kind of fall, relying either on the word, um, or the thought of the word is the same, relying on the sight, the vision, the color, the taste, or the feeling of something. High silk. Does that feel like? You use the word, then you latch onto the feeling of the cloth. The perception arises, the liking and the disliking arises. You need the form, um, because you can't have something totally abstract. This is your experience. This is what the experience is to be a human being. This describes everything. And whenever the teaching was given on these five candles, it was always said, Nothing falls outside these five candles. These five candles, these five aggregates describe everything. The point is they're describing everything that you experience in one particular moment. This is why in Buddhism then there is no internal and external. Everything is external. Then Lord Dunya, I quoted earlier, he said that the mind going outside of itself is the arising of suffering. Mind dwelling outside of itself is suffering. Mind coming back to the uh, mind is the cessation of suffering. Mind dwelling, knowing mind, is the cessation of suffering. So mind coming back is the path. Mind having come back is cessation of suffering. So everything in what is it is external. Everything is this layers of perception that comes up and disappears, comes up and disappears. Now you'll notice then with these five, where do you come in? There's no permanent you to be found. There's no self, there's no panda, there's no arthur, there's no camera. It's just these five come up and they disappear. You can't hold any of them in your mind for very long. A bit like these guys who used to spin plates on the sticks. I don't know if you when I was a kid they always had these. And they'd have to run around. Basically they get plates and they put them on a tall stick and they spin them. And then they have to run around and keep twiddling each stick to keep the plate spinning, otherwise the plate falls off. So nothing, you can't keep anything in your mind for very long. You have to keep giving it a twiddle, keep giving it a spin. Uh, you can't find yourself in any of these candles. Where is your own being? Now, this is a model, remember. 
it's not absolute truth. But when you train yourself to look in this way, what you see is a moment of perception coming up, and then it dissipates. And another moment of perception coming up, and it dissipates. Each moment is, has these five things all enclosed in it. None of them arise independently. You can't have liking and disliking without an object that you like or dislike. You can't have perception without some kind of fall that you're perceiving. You don't have mind states independently um, of consciousness, etc., etc. So these five arise dependent upon each other, like the music of a song. So, I'm going to finish off with a sutta that describes how this works. The I meets the fall. Attention is put upon this. In this moment, then, you have consciousness. You have the form of the thing you can see. You have the perception that's based around the thing you can see. You have the liking, the disliking, or neutral regarding the things that you can see. And you have mind states that are colouring this perception. All of these arise dependently, not independently. The Buddha said, one who sees dependent origination sees Dharma. So one knows these five arise dependently. Um, the desire, golden, inclination, holding, all of these are the origin of suffering. The removal of lust and desire for these five is the ending of suffering. This is the teaching by Sariputta. And then he says, if you understand this much, at that point, much has been done by you. Now, these five candles then are everything that you can see. None of them are the mind seeing the mind. The unconditioned, the thing that doesn't change, the thing that doesn't move, the thing that doesn't arise and cease, which is what enlightenment is. So now, you should all understand the story of why why Jiang, when Mitsu said, no matter how long you polish that brick, you will never make a mirror. And Jiang said it exactly. So that should be quite clear, the meaning of that story. Okay, so I've talked longer than I intended to talk. Um, do we want to do some meditation? Or do we want to just do questions and answers?